Mississippi. Oh, thank you so much. I'm, I'm Paige. I'm an alcoholic, and and what I really want to say is is. This is an absolute privilege for me to be here. It is without question, like truly an honor for me to be asked to speak in any meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous anywhere in the world, because I'm able to have the opportunity to be of service to a program and to a fellowship that has saved my life and continues to save my life on a daily basis. Um, very quickly, my sobriety date is November 17th of 2009. I have a home group. It's the primary purpose group in Calgary, Alberta. And uh, we're on Zoom as well as in person. So if you want to come visit us, we'd, we'd absolutely love to have you. We love having visitors. And, you know, I have a sponsor who is a sponsor and I have sponsees and, and, and they have sponsees. And, and I share that with, with you today so that you know the actions, some of the actions that I have to take on a daily basis to keep that sobriety date of November 17th, 2009. And one of the things, like, I love the name of this group. I don't know how it came to be, but, you know, when I think about grace and the word grace, it's, it's really something that's, that's come to me a lot more um, in the last little bit. You know, when I think about uh, grace, I think of it as an unearned gift. And what I want to say is that, you know, my sobriety without question is an unearned gift. I am sober today, but I don't deserve to be sober today. And I, and like, I mean that I do not deserve to be sober any more or any less than anyone here in this zoom room or anyone out there that is taking their last drink. I don't deserve it, but I was given it. Right. And, and that, by the way, I'm not saying I'm your speaker. Isn't saying that I got like lazy boy recovery that like, I just show up and I'm like, sober, it's a gift. Woohoo. Like there is a lot of work that I have to do on a daily basis that gets me in the position to the, receive the gift of sobriety and a deeper gift, that gift of emotional sobriety. But knowing that I didn't earn it, knowing that I don't inherently deserve it, helps me to see this gift of sobriety in a completely different way. And it helps me to see these daily actions that I have to continue to take or get to continue to take in a different way. Instead of, you know, the maintenance steps of 10 and 11, it's, it's the like preservation of the gift steps. You know, like I, I, I'm kind of going over here instead of going over there. But what I, wanna, what I want you to know is like, alcoholics as a general rule tend to not be a fan of maintenance. You know, like it's like I've been given a car and somebody's like, can you do maintenance on it? Like, woo, that's not a lot of fun. But I'll tell you, there's a lot of gifts in doing this work on a daily basis and taking daily action. And also those, those daily actions that I think sound like changing the oil really turn into like supercharging that car. And it's incredible what happens. So, so first and foremost, I'm an alcoholic. And, and what that means is that I have an abnormal reaction. And when I say I have, I have an abnormal reaction, I have an abnormal reaction to, to alcohol, but I also have an abnormal reaction to sobriety. And when I say I have an abnormal to reaction to alcohol, what happens for me is I take a drink and there's some stuff that happens to me that doesn't happen to non-alcoholics. And what happens for me is I take a drink and, and you let me know if you experience this, but I take a drink and I experience <sighs> just relief. But something else happens. It's a little voice in the back of my head. And that little voice tells me more. And the more that I drink, the more that I have to drink. And I have no control over the amount that I take. And once I stop, in all honesty, I can't tell you what's going to happen. But I, more often than not, I drink my way into a place of oblivion. I drink my way into a place that I cannot stop right? I have absolutely no control over the amount that I take. And if that was my only problem, sobriety would be my solution, right? I would just stop drinking and everything would be okay. But my experience is that I stop drinking and I don't feel the way that other pe people feel when they experience sobriety. A normal person might experience sobri sobriety in and of itself, abstinence, and they just feel better and feel well and and be okay in their own skin. And that's not my experience. My experience is I get sober and I get worse. I get sober and I'm stuck in myself. 
right? I'm stuck in this bondage of self. I'm filled with anxiety and depression and this sense of loneliness and this inability to sit and be okay in my own skin. And I feel pain and depression and I get a thought. And here is the kicker for me as an alcoholic, the most insane thing that I will ever do, the most insane thought that I will ever have happens to me when I am as physically sober as I am here with you today. And that is to take that first drink. And that insane thought comes to me, it's, it's in a voice that I believe. And it tells me things like, Paige, it'll be different this time. Nobody will ever know. You've done so well for three weeks. Take the edge off. Or it'll be, it, there's some self-awareness I always like to talk about where it's like, I'm being a jerk. Like I'm being a real jerk to everybody in my life. And if I just take a little bit, like just have a drink or two, it'll take the edge off. It'll be nicer to everyone. In which case my relapse because it becomes a public service for all of you. So you're welcome. And, and eventually I'll be round, round the corner to make the amends for, for that relapse. But what is true for me as well is that that insane thought also looks like effort, right? It looks like I don't care. It looks like I am in so much pain. I don't care whether I live or die. I need to take a drink. You know, and, and for a drunk like me, when I am in this place, right? And, and in the doctor's opinion on page XXV, I, 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 we talk about the cycle of alcoholism. And that's what I have a disease that is a cycle, right? And I can very simply identify it in myself. If I have no control over the amount that I take every single time. And when I have sworn off and said, I am never going to drink again, if that has no effect. And if that is my experience, I'm probably an alcoholic and I'm probably in the right place. But the reality is, if that is me, I am in a hopeless condition. And one of the threads throughout our book, Alcoholics Anonymous, in step one is the hopelessness of my predicament. And I won't like, and for me, I got to this place in my drinking and, and beyond in my drinking in my life where I, I was at the jumping off point and I didn't know. I reached this point where I thought I thought I had only two options in life. And that first option was to just drink myself to the bitter end, right? To blot out the, unconscious, the consciousness of my intolerable situation as best I could, right? The, I thought, I thought the best that I could do was a hopeless drunk, right? And I, and I had drank myself into some, into some pretty bad situations where I was at times living on the streets and at times living in drug houses and, and not good places. Again, that does not make me an alcoholic. Those are just some of the geographic locations I ended up as a result of my alcoholism. But my, the other thought that I had was that I could end my life, right? And those were my options. And I think it's very important that I share that with you today in case there is anyone here that feels like that, in case there is anyone there that to here tonight that feels like that tonight. Because I think it is important that we also understand not just the hopelessness of my dilemma, because it allows me to surrender, but the fact that there is a way out. And it is, and I found it here in Alcoholics Anonymous, and as a result of taking these 12 steps very specifically, following the directions as closely as possible out of this book. And as a result of that, my life changed. And again, if you are new today, if you are in that level of pain today, if you are not sure if this thing will work for you, what I want you to know, you are not alone. And I know that there are people, including myself on the Zoom call, who want nothing more than to help you through this work and help you find this new way of life. In fact, my life depends on it. You know, when I came, I came to Alcoholics Anonymous and, and I was faced with step one, that conceding to my innermost self that I have this disease, that there will never be a time in my life where it is safe to drink, ever. And, and that being said, there will never be a time for me and I've come to see the second surrender where I can never be fully engaged in Alcoholics Anonymous safely, right? For me, I have a disease that is as alive when I am sober as it is when I'm drinking if I am not treating it with the power of a God that I came to find in Alcoholics Anonymous. And so, and so for me, when I came to step one, step one for me was not, I will never drink again. Step one is absolutely, I will drink again if I do not find a way out, if I do not find help. 
And step two was the proposition that there could be something greater than me that could relieve me of that insane thought to take that first drink. Right, that insane thought that I had sober that took me back again and again and again. Right, and, and here's the thing, I got sober young. Don't worry, I burnt my life to the ground real bad. And like, I definite, definitely qualify, I should be here. Um, and, and the people who love me and care about me will um, say that as well, because, you know, uh, it, my life was a bit of a mess. Um, it was unmanageable, really. The truth is it was an un unmanageable. And uh, in step two, I, I was presented with the prospect of a new manager. And I got sober young and, and the word God, and, and I didn't understand what the second step was really talking about. But for my understanding today and my experience today, the second step is asking me to believe, could there be something that is bigger than me that could relieve for me that insane thought? And what happened for me is I saw sober alcoholics that were happy and sober at the same time, and even on weekends. And they said that a power greater than them, that many of them had called God, had done that for them. And I believe that that could be possible for me too. That being said, I did have issue with the, the word God, you know, and, and I came in with prejudice and, and I read We Agnostics and We Agnostics is absolutely one of my favorite chapters in this whole book. But when I got here, it's reading about the prosaic steel girder and you lost me. Like I didn't know what was going on, right? Love the prosaic steel girder now. It's like, ooh, right? And, and really, um, we can change our minds about things in Alcoholics Anonymous. It's wonderful. Um, but I came in with a lot of prejudice and I came in with God resentment. And, and I'll tell you, my experience is if I resent a power greater than myself, that means I have belief. That means I have faith. That means I, I'm already there for step two. Don't you worry. Right. But I came in and, and I heard the word God and I'm like, oh, I don't know. It's not cool. But I, I was able to have an open enough mind. And out of convenience, I started using that word God purely out of convenience. And that word God began to mean not what I thought that you meant, not the prejudices that I had, but what I experienced in Alcoholics Anonymous and what I experienced in my own life. And it talks about that in, in We Agnostics, where it talks about like, you might have had religion pushed on you. You might have, you might have these God resentments and the question of if there is a God, why did bad things happen? But when enchanted by a starlit night, we then think, who, who made all this? And I, I happen to live um, not far from the mountains, like the Rocky Mountains, one of the most beautiful places on earth. And, and time after time, I can hear about going to that place in nature and, and having this experience. And that's one of the things that opens us up. The other is seeing the evidence, like seeing the evidence of this working for other people. But also what opens me up is just having my butt absolutely kicked by this disease. You know, and I came to the third step. And for me, the third step is just a decision to live this way of life, to work these 12 steps. And, you know, and I always like visual, I love metaphors. So if, if, if you're not a fan of metaphors, like I am sorry, you guys got the wrong speaker. I love metaphors. Um, but for me, and it talks about this in the book. It's like we had a new employer. And so for me, I see the third step is the signing of an employment contract. But first, I need to be fired. Because here's the deal. In step one, what I saw is that my life was unmanageable. And I was the one that was managing it. And I was the one that managed it into a position of unmanageability, right? I was the one that drove the bus into the ditch, right? And in step two, there's this new manager and that, that works, that works for other people, that, that allows them to be happy and at peace. And it's like, okay, there's some evidence. And for step three, I always see it as signing that employment contract. And, and in an employment contract, we get the opportunity, right? There's things that I am given and promised in that contract, right? And it says, um, being all powerful, he provided what we needed. And what I am promised is that everything that I need will be given to me. Not necessarily everything that I want, though. That's a very important distinction, but everything that I need. If, and again, in an employment contract, there's some things that I have to do, responsibilities that I got to show up for, right? If I keep close to him, 
and perform his work well. And how do I keep close to the God of my understanding? For me, it's as simple as working these steps. That's it. I work these steps. And what is God's work for me? I, I, think, I think Dr. Bob had a, had a beautiful description of it by talking about love and service. God's work for me is to be of love and service, right? To carry this message to other alcoholics, to practice these principles in all my affairs. And I prom my experience is that if I do that, it is more than enough. Um, I, I've, okay, I wasn't planning on talking about this. Um, yeah, but I just, I feel called to talk about it now. Uh, talking about the third, the third step um, and a little bit of backstory is uh, I, I have physical disabilities. Uh, that occurred when I was uh, a little over 18 months sober. And I might talk a little bit more about that. I, I might not. I, I kind of don't know where this is going. It's an adventure for all of us. Um, but I did, I want you to know, I did, I did ask that God direct my thoughts and direct my words. So hopefully it's not just me driving this bus. Um, but I, I developed very suddenly uh, neurological symptoms. And uh, what that means is, is that I need to use a wheelchair to get around. And, you know, and what that means is that I had to learn how to read again in sobriety and, and that I have uh, vertigo, which leads to chronic nausea. Fun fact, if you're not sure if the God that I found in AA has a sense of humor, I throw up way more now in sobriety than I ever did when I was drinking. Woo! Um, it is a good life, though. Don't, like, for those that are new and hearing that, like, oh, it's a wonderful life that I've been given. Um, and... Uh, and I had this beautiful, wonderful experience um, when I was in the hospital, uh, when I realized that I had so much to be grateful for. Uh, I, was, I was in a hospital bed um, next to a gentleman that was almost vegetative. And that experience taught me really that like, you know, at that moment in the hospital, consumed with self that, that you know, really my, my life is, is a gift. And, and I remember that so clearly because it was the first time I ever said a prayer of gratitude. It was the first time I ever said, thank you, God, for what I have. And it's almost a little embarrassing to say that that was the first time, but really that was the first time. Um, but after that, I really tremendously struggled with, with the spiritual malady, with the bondage of self. Like I, I got stalled out on my steps because, because I had cognitive difficulties and, and I didn't know how to ask for what I need because, you know, I have memory problems and, and all of this, but I was consumed with self-pity and I was consumed with this, like, life being unfair. And it was a period where we, we all go through this, where, where people are dying, you know, of our disease. And I was going to a lot of funerals, you know, and I, I just felt this hopelessness. Thank God. Thank God for that hopelessness. And um, I just felt this hopelessness. And uh, there was one more funeral, one more young, young man died of this disease. And I wasn't gonna go. And I was at that place where I just wanted to do that emotional turtle, where you pull the covers over your head and just want to tune out the world and I don't want to deal with any of it. But sometimes God comes to me as somebody asking for help. And a friend of mine, said, Paige, I need you to come to the service. I need you to come to this funeral. I need you to be there for me. And thank God I was taught in Alcoholics Anonymous to say yes, right? Hopefully, if, if maybe, I don't know what my message here today is, but I'll say yes. When I've said yes to Alcoholics Anonymous, when I have said yes to this thing, my life has changed for the better. And I said yes, because I was taught to say yes, and I practice saying yes. And I remember waiting, I was sitting, I was sitting uh, in front of the house waiting for him to pick me up that morning. And I felt a sense of peace, a true deep sense of peace. And I go and I went to the service and it was absolutely heartbreaking. And I think there's probably nothing more tragic in life than watching parents having to bury their child and it was hard. But as I left, as I left, there was a woman that came up to me in a wheelchair. And she said to me, I'm so glad you're here because I don't feel so alone. And I do not know what God's will is for me in any sort of, and I won't pretend in any sort of grandiose way. 
But what I do know is that when I show up and try to be of love and service, my life changes and I can experience God in new ways. You know, and, and, and the third step to try to bring it back, we're going on a meandering journey, but to try to bring it back is, is that decision to work these steps, right? And I, I have this metaphor um, about, about steps four, four through seven. Um, and I don't know if anyone's, uh, like where I live uh, in Alberta, we, there's parts of it that are quite rural. Uh, where you got like old farming and you have these like old rundown like farmhouses and shacks and I don't know I just I have a lot of joy in my life because of Alcoholics Anonymous and, and and these steps and the power of God working in my life so we'll go on road trips and I'll be like it's a shack and I'll be so excited um, but essentially that's what I am is I am this old house spiritually and turns out I've been a bit of a hoarder right? I don't know if anyone, you know what I mean? Like hoarding. I've been a spiritual hoarder. And what I need is I need the sunlight of the spirit to come into that house. I love the metaphor of God or higher power as light. And the reason why is because light is not what I see. Light is the way in which I see. And as a result of doing this work and living this way of life and taking these actions I see the world in a completely new way where everything has changed and yet nothing has changed, right? I like to make the joke, the longer I've been sober and doing steps, the better my, my childhood has been and the better my family is. And, and they haven't changed, but I've changed, right? And anywho, I'm, I'm a hoarder and I've got all this stuff in my house. And one of the things that I have in my house is, is resentments. And these resentments are like newspapers, right? Newspapers that are stacked all the way up from floor to ceiling and they are just cutting out that light like nothing else. And I got fears. And for me, those fears, they're like these empty bottles and cans. You know, you can't like not step on them and they shake and they crunch and they rattle around and they sound bigger and louder than they really are. And I've got some, some sex or some relationship conduct this is a joke. This is a metaphor. Uh, it's a little like dead cats behind the freezer. You know what I mean? Because we know they're there. We just don't want to look at them. You know? It's a metaphor. No cats were actually hurt in the making of this metaphor. Um, and so what happens in the fourth step, when I go to clear this up, I come in and I go with bags and boxes and I start putting this stuff away. And as I take the newspapers down, what I see is that the information was completely wrong the whole time. In, in fact, it was almost completely reversed. And as I, and as I begin to really just take out those, fear, those fears, those bottles, those cans, I, I see how the light can, can really help me see them for what they really are, right? And as, I, and as I look at that relationship conduct, I can see how I can be a better person going forward can have an ideal for who I want to be and not even who I want to be, who God wants me to be going forward. And in my fifth step, what I'm doing is I'm taking all the bags, the boxes, all of that out of the house. And, I, and in six and seven, what happens for me is I, I ask, and I become willing and then I ask for the garbage men to come and take it away. And I, and I just love the metaphors. And, and again, I always like saying, like, if you're struggling with the concept of God, maybe the garbage men could work, right? Come and take it away. You know, and, and for me, being able to go into step nine and, and my experience, my experience with step nine it is uh, absolutely my least favorite step right before I have to go and do it. I don't know if that's anyone else's experience. Um, and I always make the joke, I try to live my life with the ninth step in mind, but there's a lot of freedom in that ninth step, right? In the ninth step for me, where I go out and repair the damage of my past, right? That is not, and like, here's, here's my experience. I have had, I have an, I have had amends that have gone incredibly well. I have had amends that have, have not been well received. I have had people, I reached out, hey, this is the deal. I'd like to make this amends with you. I'd like to make it right. And I've been blocked and they didn't want anything to do with me. But every time I have, 
I have made that effort to go out and set right that wrong. I have become more and more right sized. I've become more and more, I believe, experiencing that humility. And for me, as, as much as I would love to go on a, like the amends and, and just be perfectly forgiven and be, you know, white as snow. The reason why I make amends is so that I can be of service to the God of my understanding and to my fellows. That's why I go and make amends. And, you know, I've had incredible experiences. Um, and as a result, you know, got my family back in my life. And, and very quickly, you know, one of the things, I'll, I'll maybe share this story. It was a couple of years ago. It was a number of years ago. Um, my brother, um, he, had a, he had a cancer scare. Um, and something to kind of know about my relationship with my family is that I was not allowed um, around I have a twin brother, does not drink like me, uh, weird, uh, <laughs> he got, he got the non-alcoholic genes, um, but he, he did not allow me, uh, in his life, uh, for the first year of, of my sobriety, and I say that because I think a lot of us come in, and, and I know for me that wanting to fix it, and why haven't they, I'm three months sober, can't you see? I'm six months sober, can't you see? I'm different now, forgive me, forgive me. But it took time to demonstrate the change that was happening in my life. And, and in that first year of my sobriety, um, he got married, and, and they had the birth of their first child. And, and, uh, but little by little, I began to be let into their life and little by little I began to demonstrate that change um, and there was that point where uh, my brother he had he had a cancer scare and, and uh, he had to go to the hospital and it happened to be at the same day that my nephew my nephew has um, chronic health issues uh, and my nephew had just gotten out of surgery and and my brother's wife had like she had to take him and and she could have asked absolutely anyone to come and watch their children absolutely anyone on the face of the earth to come and watch the most precious and important thing things that people that they have in their life and they asked me and they asked me and and the gift was was not just that i got to be asked but that I got to show up and, and it was my responsibility to give my nephew his medication. Like it was like every four hours and he did not miss a dose. And, and the, the gift is that they, not for a second were they afraid, right? They're not alcoholics. They had alcohol in their house. Not for a second were they afraid that I was gonna get into it. Not for a second were they like, because my brother had been in so much pain, he, he had painkillers. Not for a second were they worried that I was gonna get into it. That, that I was going to be anything other than the most loving and caring aunt that I possibly could be in that moment. That I would not like that for me. And again, amends are done eyeball to eyeball, face to face and directly. But when I, when I speak of amends, I, I like sharing that story quite often because it demonstrates that I've been able to repair a lot of the damage as a way of living this life and and to go and do those direct amends oftentimes takes a lot of legwork of demonstrating that change you know and, and i'm and i'm a human being that gets like absolutely like jazzed absolutely jazzed about steps 10 and 11 like these steps like talking about like maintenance steps woo! Uh, and really for me they are growth steps they are steps that without question absolutely changed my life I reached a place in my sobriety uh, where I was, abs I was stuck. I was stuck. I was in that rut where I'm like, I'm kind of doing the deal, you know, and I'm not feeling well and, and I'm not feeling um, that deep and connected and that change and I'm not experiencing that fourth dimension of existence. And, and, I, and I honestly, like, it, I was far from that fourth dimension of existence where I was to be fully frank with you was I was stuck in a, and I didn't know if I wanted to be here anymore and I was absolutely suicidal in sobriety and that's and that's something that that was very very normal and common for me and I was presented with the opportunity I, I had um, a friend that was like hey Paige um, I heard about this thing called steel on steel is this something that you would be interested in doing and because Alcoholics not me, Anonymous taught me to say yes, I said yes. 
and I had the opportunity to to do steel on steel. And for those who don't know what it is, um, it's a spiritual exercise uh, that I believe was developed by by a member, Mark H, and and uh, where it's really about holding each other as spiritual mirrors to try to help each other grow into the people that God would have us be and, and to get current, right? Get current about the things in our lives that are blocking us. And, and we would meet once a month and, and we would talk about what our current spiritual condition is and we would receive considerations and, and, and take those into prayer and meditation over the next month. And, and it was an incredible experience because it, First and foremost, it helped me to get unstuck, but then it helped me get disciplined in 10 and 11, in daily prayer, in daily morning prayer, in daily morning meditation, in daily evening prayer, in daily evening, med I'm working on the daily evening meditation, it's where I'm growing right now, and daily evening written review. And what that did for me is it absolutely changed my sobriety. For the first time in my entire life, I did not want to die. And I, my whole life, I, I, you know, I had times where it was a bit better and a bit worse, but like I experienced joy for the first time in my entire life. And that little voice on my shoulder in the back of my head that said, Paige, checking out's always an option, that left, that left. And it, what, what that was, was me seeking God and and time and time and time again here in this program what I've experienced is is the truth of God does for me what I could not do for myself in and of my own power of all the things that I try I couldn't get that voice to go and in seeking God it went just like how all the things that I tried could not get that little voice that said you can take a drink to go right and and there is absolute beauty in this, in what we have here. And I, I, again, I can't undersell it enough. And we talk about step 10 and the step 10 promises. I mean, for those that are new and uh, that are in pain, it is in, incredible, the freedom that we can have. The step 10 promises, it talks right after love and tolerance of others is our code. It, it, it talks about that I have been placed in a position of neutrality, safe and protected. I have not even sworn off. Instead, the problem has been removed, right? And, and I love, there's so many ties in throughout our book, right? And in step three, I am hoping that, that my will and my life will be cared for. And in step 10, I can see the evidence, the evidence that I have been cared for. I am safe and protected. And that insane thought to drink has been removed. And, you know, we, here in Alcoholics Anonymous, we have, we have absolutely a singleness of purpose. And um, one of the things with um, step 11 is, is it taught me to seek. And it taught me to seek from, from all these different ways and, and always rooted in the 12 steps, right? Um, and it, it says in our book, be quick to see where religious people are right. And and in, in Steel on Steel, I was kind of asking, like, what are you doing to kind of grow that spirit, spirituality? And one of the things for me is, is, again, I have a lot of fun in Step 11, right? I have a lot of fun in, like, trying to, like, do different things. And, and um, you know, just this past week, uh, I, I, did, uh, I did a bit of a uh, practice for Rosh Hashanah. I'm not Jewish, and, and I want you to know that I do treat these religious uh, ceremonies with tremendous respect and reverence, and, and I take them very seriously. And it was this opportunity to experience this beautiful, essentially a step seven experience of letting go and, and giving to God the defects of the past year, and it was beautiful. Um, but the story that I, I really want to tell um, is that I've done Lent for a number of years. Again, this is just my spiritual journey. You don't have to do any of this. This is just some of the things that I've done that has really brought me joy in step 11, which um, again, is, tells you a little something about my personality that I'm like joy and then the, the holiday about giving things up and like suffering. Um, but uh, you know, for a long time I, I, I smoked. Uh, cigarettes like nicotine and, and I switched to vaping and 
And it was one of those things that I did not think I could ever give up, you know, and, and I, we were coming up to Lent this year and I, I was working with some of my sponsees and, and I, I just, I knew where I felt called in terms of like adding to my prayer life and, and giving to others, but I did not know what I wanted to give up. And, and I just kind of threw it out. And I, I had two sponsees that both said, why don't you quit vaping? And I'm like, could you not? <laughs> could you absolutely not? Uh, no, no, no. I don't rank sponsees, but I mean, bottom of the list. I'm just joking. <laughs> um, and then what I did, I've been doing a lot in the last few years of um, two-way prayer, which is something that a lot of the early uh, Oxford group members did and a lot of the early AAs did. And it, it's this beautiful practice of, of sitting in quiet and, and asking our higher power for direction and, and receiving it in the form of, of writing. And I asked, what should I give up for Lent? And, and what I felt deep inside myself was you either trust me or you don't, right? That's step two proposition. God is everything or God is nothing, right? You either trust me or you don't. And I said, that's fair. <laughs> what? Yeah, dude, fair. Fair, I either trust you or, or I don't. And, and then a really cool thing happened is I, I was working with a lot of sponsees at that time. And, and, you know, we were still meeting in person. It was pre COVID and, uh, you know, I was in it and I wasn't smoking as much. And I was like, Oh, Oh, maybe, Oh, maybe we could do this. Right. And, uh, it was the day before the day before Lent started. And, uh, I was like, Nope, never mind. Change my mind. Absolutely not. No. Nope, I've made a terrible mistake. And like, you know, I'm like, oh, the nicotine levels and oh, that'd be great. And nope, just no. And, uh, and then again, I just showed up, right? I just showed up and did this work. So I worked with, I worked with the sponsee and, uh, and I had another sponsee come and in between we we're like, yeah, let's go for a smoke break. And as I was sitting uh, out with them explaining, like, I don't know about this, you guys. I think I've made a terrible mistake. I should not be giving up vaping. Uh, the vape caught on my wheelchair and fell to the ground and smashed. And I got that message loud and clear. And again, we have a singleness of purpose. And this story isn't page quit vaping. This story is that God continually has done for me the things that I could not do for myself. And it is when I continue to seek God in my life that my world changes, right? And that things can continue to change and grow in new ways, you know? And, and, and again, like even during COVID, COVID has been like this incredible time for my sobriety where I've been able to connect with amazing, wonderful people all over the world, all over North America. Like I'm blessed to be able to be here tonight with you. It's not something I would have ever experienced, you know, and, and I've been on this journey with really working in my step tens, like those in the moment watching and turning and, and seeing this beautiful link between step seven and step 10. And it's, it's experiencing what, what can happen is, as I watch for these defects to arise and ask for them to be removed and then turn, like turn to God, like ask them to be removed and then share with another typically alcoholic and, and turn my thoughts to someone I can help. And, you know, to speak on step 12, Step 12 for me, it's, it's got three parts, right? And the first part of step 12 is having had a spiritual awakening as the result, having had. And one of the things is when Abby sat down with Bill, like when we read that story, Abby, it, it says, my friend promised that when these things were done, right? Having had is a promise, right? It is promised of me that if I do this work, I will get this result of a spiritual awakening. And if I can have that experience again, which is a gift and I can nurture it, I won't have that insane thought that takes me back to that first drink. And I can live sober and at peace at the same time, which again, I didn't think was possible. You know, and, and that's the first part of it for me, that there's promise and there's hope. And again, maybe I don't know what my message is meant to be tonight, but again, that if I am at a place of hopelessness, there is hope here in Alcoholics Anonymous. I got to do some work, but there's hope. 
And the next, the next part of it is that I carry this message to other alcoholics. And I will tell you that it has become an absolute joy of my life to be able to sit down with another alcoholic. You know, one of the things that I have found when I came in and I, I spoke very briefly about those God resentments. And if, if there was a God, why did those bad things happen to me? But as a result of taking them through the steps, and then as a result of being willing to give this gift that I have been given to somebody else, those things that have happened to me, the worst things that I've ever done and the worst things that have ever happened to me are now gifts and blessings in my life because they allow me to carry this message. They allow me to sit down with typically another woman and say, I've been there. This is how I got through. It is a gift, right? What we have, these steps and the power of the God that we have here absolutely transforms my life. Again, I get to see these things in a completely new and different way. And one of the things is that working with others has taught me so much about God and so about, and again, whenever I say God, I want to be very clear that I am speaking of the God that you are most open to, right? The conception of a power greater than yourself that you are most receptive to. That's what I mean. I am talking about what I've experienced. And, and so for me, it's taught me about God's love. Because when I'm sitting down with another alcoholic and, and then we're, we're doing the steps and, and I'm receiving that fifth step and that, that other human being is sharing with me the worst thing that has ever happened to them and the worst thing that, that they've ever done. And I can sit and I can look at them and I can feel no less than love. No less than love. I just love them. And, and by the way, that's not something that comes easy for, for this drunk, right? Like I'm, I'm a walled up guarded sort of person, but love. And if I can love them exactly as they are, it tells me that God's probably, God's definitely not doing worse than me. You know what I mean? Like I am not kicking God's butt at loving people. You know what I mean? Um, and it's, it's one of the most incredible things. And I get the absolute blessing to, to watch that light come on in somebody's eyes, right? That light. You can see it when somebody's doing this deal, and it is amazing. And to be a small part of somebody else's miracle, it is incredible. You know, and it is giving my life meaning and purpose in ways that I could have never have imagined, right? And, you know... For me, it's, I, again, this is, this is a gift. And again, I don't, I didn't earn it. I don't deserve it. It's my responsibility to cherish it. But also that if I've been given this gift, this amazing new way of life, why would I not want to share it with others? It's like, it's like I have this debt that will absolutely never, ever be repaid. And that nobody will ever ask me to but I know in my heart it's my responsibility. And one of my favorite, and maybe I'll end on this, one of my favorite metaphors is the gaunt prospector. I just love it. You know, those hidden chapters with the hidden metaphors. And it's this metaphor of, of somebody who's, who's literally dying. You know, the, the, the gaunt as in, as in starving right? And that was me. I was dying before I got here in so many ways that I, I didn't, I wasn't even aware. And what I found was nothing less than gold. But to experience that gold, I have to give it away. And it is in giving that it multiplies. And, and that's my experience here. The more that I give, the more that I seek to serve, the more that I receive. And, and my life has been nothing short of, of, of a blessing. And honestly, nothing short of grace. So I want to thank you for having me here with you today. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to be of service. Thank you.